We're gonna do it. We're going to do this. Cricket, did you just take a recording selfie? <laughs> I just took a selfie of myself in this poncho. Swaddled in blankets Swaddled in our in freezing blankets. recording room. Cricket, tell the listeners you're in a poncho. Hello, everyone. I am wearing a Library Network branded poncho. That was a giveaway at a workshop because it is approximately 45 degrees in the room we're podcasting in. Yep. Poncho slash shawl slash blanket slash. It yes. is fleece lined. Somebody argued with me yesterday that it is not a poncho. Me. Um, that was me. It was Jeff. I, Drew also said it was not a Took poncho. Took my side. Um, I was told it was a poncho and was when just you were like blindly. bequeathed it by Sarah. Blindly believing, yeah, yeah. Sarah, former guest on the podcast, hopefully still a listener. Uh, better be. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Uh, so you're listening to A Little Too Quiet. It's the Ferndale Library Podcast, and it's brought to you by the friends of the Ferndale Library. And uh, before we start talking about uh, scary stuff and dreadful stuff, can we just start talking about, like, positive feel-goody stuff? And that's that less than 12 hours ago, we had a wonderful little concert here at this library. Oh, my gosh. It was so great. And I was working the night shift on the youth desk, which, if you have not been into the library... Uh, <laughs> means that I have a perfect view through an enormous floor to ceiling window out into the courtyard. Um, and so whenever I work the night shift during one of our outdoor summer concerts, um, basically I just say that Jeff has booked a concert for me specifically. Private That's show. So nice uh, private show, <laughs> which is really, really nice of you. And in the case of Chris Bathgate last night, mm -hmm. which is like ambient Americana folk type. It's in that realm. It was indeed precisely booked for me. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Um, thank you also to the fan who brought their adorable dog, Huron. Yeah, Huron. Huron is such a great name for a dog. Great it name is. for a dog. Especially, Very friendly dog. Especially a dog who likes car rides and hikes and adventures yes. and, and lakes and, okay. and if concerts. If I had to guess, I would say some kind of shepherd mix, perhaps. Yep. Oh. Uh, black and and gray and white dogs make us happy concerts make us happy and we're able to how cool is it that your library throws a free concert for it's you it's real cool jeff and mm -hmm. it was like wall to wall or, ga or gate to gate, gate, to gate. Oh, I'm Coast, so happy Coast courtyard. To it was lots of folks That's it was wonderful. a great time and libraries my point being libraries everywhere are doing wonderful things uh daily i was about to say on the reg but i don't think that's a thing that kids say anymore well but... so jeff here is something i've learned as a youth librarian in cricket since you worked with teens for so long perhaps you can back me up um it is important for them to be able to feel slightly superior to you oh so we gotta um, use out so of date. we gotta be cringe yeah so that they can go no one says on the reg anymore. libraries are cool uh, yeah totally on the reg. yeah yeah. One uh, time I started a teen advisory board meeting in 2017 by saying, so has anyone seen any dank memes lately? And I just cricket. about got tossed out the window. Yeah, I, it I, was so fun. They were going to defenestrate you for that. No one's used the word. No one's used dank memes with a straight face to me in like. <laughs> so this was six almost years ago. Since I was a teen. <laughs> six years ago. And I still thought dank memes was a thing. So that's how far behind uh -huh. I am. Yeah. So I'm just getting that. Holy cow. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, libraries are in the news again. You're listening to another episode where we talk about intellectual freedoms and we help you kind of catch up with uh, vague things you've maybe seen. Maybe headlines are blurring past your your feed and you're like, oh, it seems like people are talking about libraries. Can I talk? Can I say something really quick? I wish you would. Yes. I have worked in libraries so long that I remember a time cricket. You'll sympathize. <laughs> Let's say 2010. I can remember in 2010 that libraries were, frankly, uh, struggling to even be mentioned in the headlines outside of the context of uh, a headline saying libraries are irrelevant <laughs> or asking, or, are libraries irrelevant? Or the Troy Library is about to close. Yeah, just <laughs> like... Um, libraries were trying to like just be in a positive light. And it's not... But now it's uh, now it's not that we're irrelevant. No, uh, no one even really says those things anymore. Nope. We kind of got that momentum, and we were like, "Oh yes." We proved our relevancy to the point that 
Oh we're no! Too relevant. <laughs> now we're too relevant. <laughs> and apparently, therefore, must be destroyed. <laughs> apparently, are yeah. Apparently, people are very upset about libraries lately, and yeah, we were told that nobody was going to use the library anymore <laughs> because. Google was, would replace the library. However, yeah. people are using the library because Google <laughs> is useless at this point. Mm-hmm. Ads, wall-to-wall ads, mm-hmm. and search engine optimization. Yeah, and also they're they're spying on you. My my friendly advice as as your privacy obsessed librarian is please switch to DuckDuckGo. So now this is a quick mini preview of an episode we'll do later on when we get into information literacy. Yes, and I think it's worth saying that trying to talk well i am talking trash about google yeah is you should be healthy skepticism is is a word we like to use when we're talking about information literacy because the first result you might see on google is probably an ad Mm -hmm. and the second and third are probably ads probably involve money at some point to get them that high in the Mm -hmm. searches Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah um point being like either you don't need us at all or we're a threat to the very we're fabric a threat of society. To soci- like, yes. Which, which one? Yes. So in 2010, <laughs> we weren't needed, and now we're a threat. So yes. that's that's where we've become. Oh, yes. all, already, Jeff, the room feels warmer. I'm keeping myself warm with the fires of my own rage. That's true. Cricket's well, got a poncho and, a blanket. and I've got my anger. <laughs> yeah, Cricket also has a blanket in addition to you look very cozy. I, it's almost enough. I look like a fool who needs to start keeping a blanket at the office. A couple of things have recently happened, and... Mary Graham and I joke, and Cricket is in on the joke, that these episodes, the subtext is basically to answer the question for any curious patron out there. The question being, what's all this then? What's all this then? You have to do uh, it in like your terrible, like late Victorian copper on the beat. Right. Oi. <laughs> I always think Inspector Lestrade from Sherlock Holmes yes. said it, but he probably didn't. <laughs> uh, what all is all this, this then? then? And maybe you saw on Instagram that uh, Barack Obama wrote a three-page letter standing up for librarians everywhere. Thank you, sir. And swoon. I'm not. Yes, swoon. I'm not a librarian, but apparently, uh, Barack wrote this very eloquent letter. And I call him Barack like I know him. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, former president. I don't think he'd mind. I don't. I mean, I I remembered the 2008 election. They leaned into the guy you'd get a beer with. Oh, for sure. So so Barry said, uh, basically, <laughs> he's basically catching you all up, followers out there of the Instagram accounts and the patrons of and the support of all libraries that there's a lot of book challenging going on lately. I had heard. And this kind of also challenges the very ideals that America was possibly the founded on. The fabric of our democracy. free exchange of ideas. And then he went on to say that y'all are on the front lines, whether you like it or not. We sure are. So that's a uh, d- distressed side for cricket. <laughs> yeah, we are on the front lines, dear listener, and here's the thing. In some dimensions, honor and a privilege. Uh, happy to be defending your uh, your crucial rights for you. Why I, why I signed up for the job. Yeah. Um, simultaneously, please send help and or gifts of coffee and tea. Um, or, yeah, you know? for sure. We always say, <laughs> come up to the desks and just be friendly and nice. Just be friendly and nice. Yep. But that I'm the gist that I'm badly paraphrasing yeah. is that this basically you are on the front lines of defending the thing that we like to dig into in the First Amendment, which yep. involves intellectual freedoms. Yep. First Amendment. And so, yes, which dovetails into another uh, kind of related First Amendment issue, is that, Mary Graham, how are we out? It's like Montana's State it Library. It is the uh. State Library Commission of Montana, not the Montana Library Association, right. but like the government body associated with their libraries correct that, that has, one big library that one commission has voted to withdraw from the american library association because they don't like that our current president emily Jerbinski, is a marxist lesbian and you know do they not like one more than the other it's just, you know up i mean debate. there's it's, some definite so. homophobia there um and also and and when i say this i mean that is how emily self-describes like that's like in her twitter bio yeah. that's not something she's shy about right. um but and they are using like when they, you know, crafted their statement about why they were leaving, they specifically targeted the Marxist thing. The Marxist thing, their, for sure. In their um, verbiage. Yes. Uh, and my professional opinion is that that is a stupid decision. Um, that is, in fact, also the professional opinion of the Montana Library Association. Sure. And Correct. the American Library Association. Oh, we, yeah, we are definitely going to get uh, into that because uh, this this big library, this state library, uh, has left the American Library Association. Which, like, just so that the lovely folks at out. home know, 
Um, the American Library Association is not a radical body. Uh, right. <laughs> yep. Yeah, cricket. Cricket's laughing because she knows. She yes, knows. It's an understatement. It's an understatement. <laughs> um, and I went to library school with a lot of Marxist queer people. And and so I went to a library school that was full of people being like, the ALA is not radical enough. Um, and right. so, you know, it, it's... But also, like, I believe that libraries should be members of the ALA. Like, this is... Absolutely. This... this at, at it, the end of the day, it's a... Sorry, the mind has been boggled. <laughs> I know, I know. But let's, let's catch up because the first thing I wanted to kind of, like, touch into is that it's... I think it should be covered under your First Amendment rights to not necessarily be discriminated for political views you may have in your place of employment. So that's partially what's going on here. And uh, as you said, the Montana Library Association yes. has an ALA rep. And that ALA rep has said, well, this is scary because whatever your feelings about the ALA, they they do do, they do do some good things. They oh, do go out of their way absolutely. to help libraries get funding or training or professional development or resources or even better broadband for smaller libraries. All these I've nice things. I've been on a panel for them. It was a fantastic experience. Right. Like the, the thing about ALA is that, that as much as, as I and some of my grad school cohort might be like, okay, now go further. I would never, ever think that I'm like, that's an enormous organization that gives people money and right. training. Right. Yeah. Why would you, right. why would you deprive yourself of that when they really don't ask anything of you right. except your dues? Right. Like, the, and they give us cute bookmarks. Right. And it's, they bookmarks. do. And it's not like they would ever look at Montana and be like, we're kicking you out of ALA. Are you kidding? That right. would never happen. Right. Because ALA is very much y'all come in now. Y'all come in um, now. Which is a, which is a, a library vibe. It sure it's is. Whole- <laughs> well, and a lot of it is like member driven. Yes. Right. Although they do have like some, you know, people on boards and such. A lot of it, like a lot of LA. ALA is actually the librarians who make up yeah. ALA. Right. And yeah. Institutions are made up of people. to sit on panels yeah. and offer things. So it's... Uh, the scary yeah. thing here that the ALA rep from Montana said uh, when he was answering questions uh, concerning what's all this then is the concern of uh, domino effect. Right. You know, I, I... Hopefully not, fingers crossed. Hopefully yeah. that's just, you know... I mean, we we on this podcast often, especially in these episodes, we present what is the worst scenario, and, and that is um, close to one of the worst scenarios. So hopefully not. That, that just, other libraries in Montana would say, that big Montana library did it. Right. It's We're. just such a punishment because like, and it's, it's, it's not that ALA doesn't care, but mm-hmm. like, honestly, it's a national body. Right. Like, what materially is is going to happen to the ALA if this, you know, one Montana State Library basically withdraws. Mm-hmm. But they're going to lose so much in resources. Mm-hmm. It's it, it feels like cutting off your nose to spite your face. Right. Um and funding. They and funding. funding. Yeah. So uh, that's how I feel about that. I mean, that's my professional opinion on that. Yeah, they wanted to make a big statement and right. they did stay tuned um <laughs> i'm trying to find it and the statement feels like oh we're gonna we're gonna target one person in particular and deviation from what we think the norm will not be tolerated mm-hmm. um and i don't like that statement yeah it's a no from me yeah it's just like anyone who is a part of an organization like that is different people are bad I guess that's the, the statement they're trying I to I think so. A, a uh, person who is different than me is like a bad person. Yeah. And I will not associate with that person yeah. in any form. Yeah. And that brings us back to, to Barry's letter is that we we want all voices to be heard. I thought that was the whole idea here. So mm-hmm. so that that's that's some of the latest. That's Montana. I got some Michigan news. Yeah. What's the Michigan news? Some Michigan news? Well, let's see. Back in June... Uh, The Michigan Civil Rights Panel asked Dana Nessel for a formal legal opinion on whether school board book bans, school book bans, uh, can be considered a form of discrimination. Um, So Dana Nessel's our attorney general. uh, Interesting. Yeah, well, the Civil Rights Commission asked this because so many of these books are being banned for LGBTQ content, which in Michigan is now a protected class under the Elliot Larson Mm -hmm. uh, Civil Rights 
laws that we have. Um, so legal opinions take some time to generate. So we don't have the opinion back from her office yet. But I thought it was interesting that like a formal, like the government civil rights panel has asked. The Michigan Board of Education adopted a resolution expressing concern over censorship, which we did look at in um, our Intellectual Freedom Task Force meeting. And we were like, this is nice, but they're also just like, this seems like a problem. Right. And we're like, all right, so we've been saying that. We've been we've been saying that, guys. Right. Um, uh, if people are looking, are, are thinking like, oh, you know, I, I see these things float past on my social media, mm-hmm. but I'm, I want to, I want to keep up with this. I want, you know, good news sources. Highly recommend Bridge Michigan, mm. uh, which is my favorite Michigan news source. Um, nonpartisan. Uh, I think I, they're based in Detroit. I think very thoroughly researched. Yeah. Um, Chalkbeat Detroit, so Detroit.chalkbeat.org uh, is where you want to go for anything to do with schools. Nice. Um, and then just in general, remember, you can always go to MyRightToRead.com, that's M-I, like Michigan, uh, and click in the news. And that is going to be an aggregate mostly from like tiny local news sources. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. If you work for a tiny local news source and you are listening to this podcast, please know you have my profound thanks. Because <laughs> that's how I know what's going on in Brandywine. Right. It's not great, right. but I know about it. Right. Um, and so uh, we have a lovely person who works for MLA who... Uh, pulls that news from all over the state puts them in one place at myrighttoread.com for you to access that's great uh so people so go to that website people because should go check that out you also again teeing up our information literacy you can't necessarily rely on just your feed you really should not please do not rely on just your feed y- uh, your feed knows what you like and it keeps feeding your your bias i also commend to everybody of all ages listening to this podcast my feed knows i like barry so i saw barry stuff yeah sorry (laughs) no it's okay it's true the best book and we'll we'll bring this up again when we do the information literacy pod but the best book i've ever read about information literacy uh and conspiracy theories is called killer underwear invasion (laughs) it is by elise gravel it is in our children's section but i think every single person should read it because i read it and i was like this is the best primer on how to tell if someone on the internet is lying to you. Listener, can you believe that some people go on the internet and lie? Mm-hmm. They do. Sometimes they don't even do it on purpose. Killer Underwear Invasion. Yes. Killer Underwear Invasion. By Elise Gravel. Marvelous. Um, so you can read that while you're waiting for the Information Literacy podcast. It won't take very long. Incredible. Um, it's got really funny illustrations uh, and also a lot of really detailed information wonderful i love children's nonfiction. um the other sort of michigan book band news that i wanted to highlight uh, was a very interesting i found this a very interesting case from hudsonville back in may uh, where the memoir jarhead by anthony swafford has been pulled from their school library and, a book and made into a movie apparently. a book made into a movie an starring jake gyllenhaal 10 years ago um mm-hmm. no oh, oh jeff sorry 20 years ago. i have no frame of reference six years ago our head was was published two entire decades ago hashtag dang Um, memes hashtag (laughs) it is uh it is a memoir um of a young man who served in the marines and it's i have not read it um i have read an op-ed by the author in the daily beast um where he's like it's a it's a candid account of of what i saw as a young man in com I mean it was published in 2003 like this guy was was serving and we had a lot of active wars going on um I would not be surprised if he saw some stuff mm-hmm. um and pe- people complained that this book was on the shelf of the school library it wasn't in the curriculum it wasn't mm. in any classroom libraries but they were like oh it, it disrespects the troops mm. uh because this man talked about some negative experiences he had in the military and he was an and in the op-ed in the daily beast anthony swafford was like you know interestingly enough no one who has ever actually served in the military has told me my book has disrespected the troops he's like i've met he's like i've met other veterans who don't like a lot of the things i say in this book but they would never tell me not to say them Mm -hmm. why did we all go and fight like you know um and actually protecting here exactly uh and and he was like i was honest it's a true story Mm -hmm. um something that i found very interesting so there was a review committee put together uh about 
keeping this book on the shelf in Hudsonville. And the committee recommended to keep it. And the Board of Education rejected that recommendation. Um, and there was a, a parent at that board meeting who is ex-Army, mm-hmm. who was like, we have recruiters in this school. What do you mean that like you expect an 18 year old to sign on the dotted line, but you won't let them read about right. what it, what they could be signing up for. Oh boy. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and, as, so, and also as if there's never been any other book that's been mildly critical. Well, like and, this, and it's, and it's, like well, apparently, I mean, honestly, and the reason I'm so intrigued by this is because, this is 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 breaking the pattern mm-hmm. of the types of books that we've been seeing challenged mm-hmm. um and and the people who are like oh we don't want this book on the library because you know he talks about you know being suicidal mm-hmm. you know while on his tour of duty and you know the violence of war and the sexual violence of war as well and and it feels like a little the old lie dolce et decorum est per patria mori like oh no maybe if we let kids read this book they won't sign that dotted line mm-hmm. And they won't join. Uh, this and... is going to tee up one of my favorite band books later on in the episode when we do yeah. talk about that. <laughs> um, and so I just, I'm really, really, I mean, I'm sorry anytime a, a book is banned, especially from a school shelf. And this was in a high school library. I mean, that sounds like an age appropriate book. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I haven't, I haven't read the book myself and I haven't done a ton of research on it, but it sounds like this young man joined pretty young. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it does, it's not the memoir of a 30 something in the army. Right. It's, he would have been close to the age that the kids reading this book would be, um, which I can see a lot of value in that, especially if a kid is thinking, Hey, should I join up? Mm-hmm. You know, you want to, again, you want to get all those perspectives. Wait a minute. Well, and from my teen librarian years, I do remember that I had a lot of high school readers who were very specifically interested in war stories. Yeah. Like, they can enjoyed I, them. Can I also date ourselves, though, since Mary Graham is younger than us? Yes. Like, we were in the biz at the peak of, if not the dwindling peak of, the most recent Af- war in Afghanistan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, Crick and I were getting into this out of college and yeah so that was that was just in the zeitgeist or and the i news. was a six-year-old with a, an anti-war <laughs> button on my backpack i am not joking no but um where was i going with that where were you going with that well i was just saying like whatever you think you know this book is trying to do it's trying to make a person think a certain way about the war it's also like taking away a, a teenager's right to just like read a book on a topic that they're interested right. in just for the sake of entertainment or yeah. interest yeah yeah. Well, let's, and I would let say also not forget about that. Yeah. yeah, I would say that most of the um I've I've had young adult readers advisory questions with uh with kids who were like, "Oh, I'm interested in in historical fiction." And like, yeah, if you have any war stories, if you have anything, you know, Civil War, World War II, World War 1, like all that kind of stuff, whether they have any particular military interest or not in mm-hmm. their own lives, mm-hmm. It's also just maybe they just like stories set then. Yeah. And especially, man, if you enjoy World War II, have I got some books for you? There's right. a ton of them. Um, but some of the best historical fiction I've read has been about World War One. Mm-hmm. Um man. and it, I don't know. Like it's just stop take stop taking autonomy away from teenagers. Mm. Especially once I mean, we do live in a country where you can go be shot in a foreign war before you can legally have a drink of alcohol. Um, and I think that you should certainly be afforded your right to gather all the information necessary mm-hmm. on anything. Mm-hmm. Um, if we also think that you are old enough. Right. To if go- any other teenager was like me out there, when I was 17 or 16, I wanted to know it all. Yeah. Rather than, I think the cliche of teenagers is they think they know everything. I was hungry yeah. to know everything. As much as I could. Yeah. I want to learn more. Yeah. What's out there? Yeah. So don't take away that opportunity. Folks, have you heard any clattering next to the room next to us? That's because... Uh, Delivery. Big, <laughs> big shipment of interlibrary loan books are coming in. Yep. To... All the books you requested. It's They're one here. On the Again. Uh, You'll be getting your emails shortly. A note on the awesomeness of libraries. <laughs> uh, so on the subject of libraries, uh, we won't be returning to another intellectual freedom podcast until early October. And by then, it will be banned books week because jeff what did we learn this week uh, well so i 
so it's Ju- it's July, and July is when my brain starts thinking about September because mm-hmm. my brain is always three months ahead. Mm-hmm. And that was when I finally discovered, I'm probably late to the game because I'm sure 10 to 20% of all library people out there are a little more ahead of the game than I am. But OMG, Cricket, did you know that Banned Books Week, a time in memoriam has always been in September, is not in September this year? What? It's in so the first week of October. How can this we be? have a couple theories. It's it's a fr- it's like October first, October. Why would 7th. they do this? It okay, was all- so okay, so that's here's, what I thought. Here's our theories. We have theories. So my theory um, is that <laughs> too many books have been banned, and they had to push it back. To make the more room time in to the ca- schedule yep. to make time because they don't have time to update all the lists yeah, Jeff, that are coming. What, what is your theory? <laughs> My theory is that they moved it into a month that I usually associate with spooky time and Ooh. horror and Halloween because it is scarier than it has ever been. Yeah, usually it falls right around my birthday. Mm-hmm. Usually it's like the third week of September. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, ALA could answer that. ALA, please call in. Uh, <laughs> Let's ask our Marxist lesbian president of ALA. I have spoken to Emily Jabinski on the phone before. I could probably. Yeah. Just, yeah. just No, I'm all for it. No, dial. and just, you know, FYI, Banned Books Week is coming up and it it, it's, it's also like this nice capper at the end of or near the end of a wonderful month called library card sign up month come get your library cards oh my gosh because oh my gosh you can get so much Please. with a library card you yeah. can get so much without a library card because you can just randomly walk up into our courtyard and enjoy a free concert because yeah. we're just there but you should get a library card i uh was speaking late last week with somebody who works uh, across the parking lot from the Ferndale Library. Um, and across the parking lot from the Ferndale Library is is municipal offices, etc. And this person said, oh, I haven't been into a library in about 20 years. Um, and I did not say to them, why would you say this to me, a person who works in a library that is literally across the parking lot from where you were instead because I tried to be friendly in my profession I said oh well we could just cross the parking lot you should come see us and no matter where you live because you work in Ferndale you get a card here Mm -hmm. um but also oh my gosh please people don't let anything even a parking lot separate you yes from the joy that can be had when you come get your library card and I think it was cricket my brain needs to catch up here was it cricket that I overheard? You and I were talking to someone the other day and you were like, you should, even if you don't think you're going to use it, just get it. Just get it. Because it helps support yeah, your library. It, when we went to Urban Rest, maybe? We went to Urban Rest, which is a nearby brewery where we're going to be doing a library program. Uh, yeah, because some of library funding comes from statistics. And exactly. if we can say we have X number of library cards in yep. the system. Um, we so, can get more but, funding, but also but, if you come in here to get the card, you are going to see something you want. And yeah. here's the oh, thing, yeah. like, right, like it's it's this one one cool trick. Right. Um, I almost said one cheap trick, but it's not even just cheap; it's free. Um, but this one cool trick where you come and you get your library card, and you think, ah, it's just to help make things a little bit nicer for the librarians. And then we say, but let's tell you about this app called Libby, right? And also an app called Hoopla, mm-hmm. and also Canopy. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, those are all digital resources, so you can get audiobooks, ebooks, Canopy is a streaming service. And like, here's, here's, so when my brain says, what if we did some online shopping? And my paycheck says, <laughs> we, we have a cat to spoil. Right. So no, right. um, I go on to Libby where all the books are free. Yep. And, and you can I favorite go, them. Even if you don't check them exactly, out, you can make a big list of your favorites. Exactly. Or you can just check them out. And then you're like, it feels like I bought a book. But I didn't because right. it's free. Right, right. But you can also, when you feel like going to Target, come to the library. And come to the and library. Browse around things. and maybe you'll see that we have a metal detector that you want to try to find your engagement ring in the backyard. That maybe happened. you'll see that we have jigsaw puzzles. and A giant Jenga game in your backyard yep. or bocce ball. Or, uh, or just like a bongos. book about something that you didn't know anybody had written a book about. So like somebody wrote a book about the best way to fold laundry. And you're like, huh. Somebody wrote a book called Index, comma, A History Of. Is that not the best book That's title great. you've ever heard? That's fantastic. Someone not only wrote a book about the history of the index. Well, you told me one about underwear, title. like killer underwear. Killer so, underwear no, invasion. I, I, I vote for that one, actually. Well, that too. Yeah. Well, but you have to read the book to find out if the killer underwear invasion is actually real or if it's misinformation. Also, I saw a kid's book the other day that was something like, um, it was like this kid looking at his butt and he was like, 
You started to say I saw a kid's book, and I was like, it's one of our butts ones, it's, isn't it? Yeah, it was about butts. Yep. It had a great title. I wish I remembered it. I'm embarrassed I don't. There's Edit a- this out. No, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. Not at all. Dear, uh, dear friends who there are children in your lives, come. Come to the kids' yeah, corner. Yeah, come take a look at our butt books. And say, literally so, say, I hear you have books. We have books about animal butts. We have books about human butts. We have picture books. We have nonfiction books. I have a nonfiction book for you about worm poop and Charles Darwin. Uh, there's also the book by Heather Radke called Butts, A Backstory. Yes, for, which is for, for grown-ups. grown-ups. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, it has a fantastic cover. Yes. It's just the peach emoji. It's uh, amazing. Um, can I... This is unrelated, but it was mentioned on a, a previous episode, just in case you missed it on the previous episode. Chris Bathgate is a uh, acquaintance of Heather Radke, and apparently there's a a uh, character or some sort of person in that book, Bats, Butts of Backstory, who is modeled after Chris Bathgate. So he's in the book. <laughs> is he going to write a song about butts and make it come full circle? Well, he wrote an album about peaches, and he thinks that's already a subtle enough <laughs> gesture. That's fair. That's, so. See, see, why would anyone want to defund us? <laughs> Um, library card sign up month is wonderful. It's September. Just come sign up for your library card. Or there's a good chance you had one and it expired. Just come in and renew it. It takes two minutes. And like you get to see our faces. You yeah. can also sign up for your card online on our website. If you too. don't if like you our faces. don't like our faces. Yeah. I mean. You can renew your card online. This is an audio podcast. So. Well, well, sure. But like I think that people should come in and be like, oh, I heard you on the podcast. You don't look. I'm waiting for someone. <laughs> I'm waiting for someone. Yeah. To, to give me the NPR host treatment and say, <laughs> you don't look like what I thought you looked like. Uh, Steven's keep looks exactly like I would think. So you does Ira like. Glass. Yes. I was just going to so, say. Uh, where were we going with this? Okay, so that library card's on with September, and that gets us into Banned Books Week, which has existed for a while now. And again, going back to 2010, I remember when Banned Books Week was kind of cutesy. Like, yeah. we would take... Mug the shots. police tape. And the police yep. tape caution. Yeah, and there just wasn't a fervor, and we were just celebrating. Oh boy, every bo- every week is banned books week now, Jeff. Right. <laughs> every week never ends. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, what was I going to say? I was going to try and uh, do a quote from The Simpsons, if you don't mind. Um, as far as librarians being on the front lines. Uh huh. Uh. To, to set it up, of course, Marge and Homer, uh, at some point, their parenting skills are questioned. They get a visit from social services, and they're accused of possibly being on drugs. And Marge says, the only thing I'm high on is love. Love for my son and daughters. Yes, a little LSD is all I need. <laughs> and so... In my head, I was kicking around this thing of, like, we don't, like, we don't have an agenda. The only A word we're focused on is access. <laughs> uh, there's no LST joke there. Um, so access, that's what the, so going back to Band Books Week when we had the police tape, it was like, we are just here celebrating that you can access these things. That what make, a world we live that in. Make, yeah, exactly. What a world. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to just kind of run down some of the books that are currently on 2022's most challenged list uh, from ALA and just a few things that are already surprising is that a lot of classics are still hanging out here mm-hmm. uh, like one of my favorites uh, Toni Morrison's uh, Bluest Eye mm-hmm. still in the mix number three yeah yeah. no number two no dang nope nope number three I'm so uh, sorry that was a roller coaster sorry. Jeff <laughs> uh, but then also you see a lot of books that have been kind of in the mix for the last decade too mm-hmm. like jonathan evison former guest of the podcast his lawn boy book is still on there oh. uh um john green has made a return john green is i'm back. really happy that john green has returned to tumblr i'm very sorry that john green has returned to the banned books list looking for my alaska. condolences my dude looking for alaska and then which like i have read looking for a Ala- here's the thing like i mean and this is not the point because very often i'll tell i i had a, a patron come in a couple months ago asking for books that had been banned and i did a loop and i pulled some of them and charlotte's web was on the stack and she was like who banned Charlotte's Web? Which which is an understandable, completely, I think, understandable well, it, it reaction. It did make me cry. 
Well, that and children should not <laughs> learn how to express emotions in a healthy and safe manner, Jeff. Right. They should not be able to explore their feelings in the realm of fiction where they are safe. Um, <laughs> for legal purposes, this is a joke. Um, right. And <laughs> it's so hard to use sarcasm on podcasts because right? you don't want anyone editing that clip. No, no, we won't. That's why we'll keep the disclaimer. <laughs> so, uh, looking, looking for, for Alaska. Alaska. <laughs> you know, which like I read as a teenager and people get... What, the scene that people in Looking for Alaska... Well, they get worked up about all the smoking and drinking, which, like, have you met a teenager? Um, but they also get worked up about uh, a scene that I have heard described as the most unerotic blowjob in fiction. Oh, my. Um, it is a single page. I actually have not read this scene because when I was a teenager and I read this book and I got to that scene, I was like, I don't feel like reading that. And I turned the page and I kept reading the book and it was fine. Wow. I know. And... A miracle. Um, it's almost like you knew what you were interested in, and, and I knew you weren't interested in my boundaries, and I knew that I was interested in the rest of the book, and that this was not that important. So, wow. Anyway, also, uh, me and Earl and the Dying Girl. Oh yeah, that, oh, that book is really funny. By Jesse Andrews. Book made me laugh. Profanity really, really hard. and claim to be sexually explicit. Mm. Uh, that's you usually see that the most more than anything else is. And uh, it's like, oh, we have different... De- oh, The Court of Mist and Fury. The Court of All Mist this- and Fury and by so Sarah J. Moss. Here's another thing about... So, Court of Thorn and Roses is a book that I read in college because I read a lot of one-star reviews that said this has too much sex in it, which is a great way for me to be like, ah, oh, well, quality control. We got to check that out. Um, <laughs> and, and I read that book and I was like, I'm unimpressed, frankly, by all those one-star reviews. Um, but I remember chatting with, uh, again, I was in library school, um, and I said, well, you know, I think what people get get up in arms about is that this is marketed as YA. This is shelved in the YA section, which, like, I think that things that shelved in YA should be things that teenagers are interested in reading, um, which is why we have Pride and Prejudice in our YA section. Right. A, right. a section that did not, a concept that did not exist when Jane Austen wrote that book. Um and I said, you know, I wouldn't have enjoyed this book as a teenager because I didn't like books with a lot of sex in them when I was a teenager. And one of my classmates was like, I wish this book had been around when I was a teenager. Yeah. To be like, you're full of hormones and you're horny and it's fine. Please calm down. And it's almost I like think that's a great example lots of like... Lots of teenagers are... Lots of different... White cricket? Other teenagers. They have different experiences. Wait a minute. They have, wait a minute. They're they individual humans with autonomy and stories needs. Stories reflected Stop in the literature. Stop the podcast. And, oh, my God. And on a... Oh, sorry. <laughs> So let's do something a little fun and and uh, talk about our our own personal favorite banned books or books that have been banned or books that have been challenged. Um, I did bring three. Did everybody else I bring brought three. three? I brought one and a an entire series. Excellent. Oh, okay. Intrigued. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna go first and tell you my okay. Because I I already told you I felt like I didn't have an original answer. But I still think it's the greatest answer. Some things are classics for reasons. And I've talked about it often on the podcast because I've already said often that it's my favorite book of all time for reasons. And it's uh, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Because if you're going to have a favorite book that has an important message, it should be the book about getting rid of all the books. Mm-hmm. Which <laughs> they then tried to get rid of. Right. <laughs> oh, it's like they didn't read the book. Right. Uh, a book about a dystopic future in which we are burning all the books. And in fact, that is a job that you can have. Oh, my gosh. But it's also beautifully written because Ray That's... Bradbury was a beautiful man who yeah. loved libraries so much. And he also loved bicycles and cats. And... My gosh. Speaking Aww. speaking of Ray Bradbury. And, and October. You, dear listeners, if you want to laugh and you don't mind some explicit language, should Google or DuckDuckGo uh, Rachel Bloom, Ray, ba- Ray Bradbury, <laughs> because she has a music video about how much she loves uh, Ray Bradbury. Uh, the title is not a title that I can say oh. on a podcast with a clean rating. This is Rachel is Bloom from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. From Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Yeah, so this was made sense. before she was on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Nice. But anytime somebody brings up Ray Bradbury. I do think of this song, the title of which I cannot tell you. Um, it, it is... We'll, uh, we'll include a censored version in the show notes. Yes. You can find. Um, uh, but uh, I do not believe a censored version of the song exists, so well. proceed proceed at one's own <laughs> risk. Um, but it's so funny. <laughs> love, it's, love Ray Bradbury. Uh, that I just... I had beautiful, to, beautiful man. Uh, again for that. Mary Graham, what is one of your picks? One of my picks... Uh, 
I'm trying to think if I should like bring out my ultimate or, or work backwards. Work backwards. I'm going to work backwards. Um, Patience and Esther by S.W. Searle, which is a graphic novel for adults. Uh, it is an Edwardian romance between two women who work in domestic service. Mm. Um, and there are, I think, a lot of things that people don't like about this book. I think they don't like that it's a... It's a graphic novel, and it's got right there on the front a, a little mature mm -hmm. thing because it is a graphic novel in which adults have sex. Mm -hmm. um, as, as This American Life might say, this book acknowledges the existence of sex. This book acknowledges <laughs> I, the existence of sex and that sometimes women have it with each other. Right. And that they've been doing that for a long time. And that sometimes women who have sex with each other a long time ago are not uh, from the same ethnicity. Right. And so there's a lot of reasons people hate this book. Sure. Um, but uh, it was given to me as a gift. I think it's a really great book. Great. So that is one of my, that's been challenged in mm -hmm. Michigan. Uh, that is one of my favorite Cricket, what is your series? The series. An entire series. An entire series. And I don't know if every book in the series has been challenged slash banned. Mm -hmm. But um, there's an author for children called Phyllis Reynolds Naylor. Yes. As far as I'm aware, she's still alive. And she wrote a series called the Alice series. And for a while when I was a kid, Alice was aging at the same rate I was mm -hmm. because oh. she kept writing more books about this character, Alice. Eventually, I shot past her because um, it takes a long time to write books. Um, and it, the reason I loved the Alice books when I was a kid is because Alice was always doing stupid things that embarrassed her. And she would be like, oh, when am I going to stop doing stupid things and being embarrassed about them? You know, relatable content. Yeah. Like the first one is called The Agonies of Alice because she's just embarrassing herself all the time. And I loved that. And after a while, they became a little bit more after school special sure. as in like, you know, in one you know, there's a sexual assault that she and her friends deal with as teenagers. And one, um, you know, like there's like some neo-Nazis at her school. And one, you know, sh like her friends are having sexual awakenings and discovering they might not be straight. You know, there, there's like different things that her groups of friends deal with. Hats off but to it, Phyllis Reynolds Naylor, a woman that I only knew as the author of Shiloh. Exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like you think of her writing wholesome dog stories, but she writes about everything. And it, she is in her 90s at this point. And so some of the later books are a little bit hilarious in that, um, you know, she's writing about millennial teenagers who like refer to their outfits as like, I wore a really nice pair of slacks to the mall. And so, you know, like, Dank bl memes. bless her, she does age a bit. But yeah. These books are just like beautiful, wonderful, relatable, what it's like to be a teenager in the United States of America or what it can be like. And because they're so honest, people get mad. Mm. You know, and we, we can't bring slacks back, can we? Slacks are out. It's not. Well, I don't. Enjoy as far as I know, pants, none of the people things. filling out the band paperwork mentioned the, the use slacks. of slacks mm. instead of pants or blouse for mm -hmm. shirt or top. Right, right. Which, if you ask me, should have been the reason to fill out this paperwork. I will challenge this. more than the existence of neo Nazis in a high school. Right. So I don't know. I love this series. I periodically reread it. Alice. Alice. <laughs> I can. I this is off topic, but sort of not. Uh, but now that I know she's in her nineties, uh, I had family members who were considering naming a new baby Alice, and one of the disputes was that sounds like an old person's I name. I love that name. <laughs> <laughs> My other book, which I hinted at earlier, involves uh, military service, and you know, again, not an extraordinary pick, but one that I always want to keep in the conversation, and it's uh, Joseph Heller's Catch Twenty Two because. Mm. Uh, serving the military can feel surreal and insane and the bureaucracy involved and the futility of it all and I mean we use that title to refer to right you know damned if you do damned if you don't exactly mm -hmm. um, it's about a man who can no really get no ticket home because they keep adding on more bombing missions that he has to do and then sort of the inhumanity of it is that Oh, you've got to do five more bombing missions. And in a way, the main character is saying, oh, man, I'm going to do five more of these. Not really also leveling with you are also dropping bombs, bombs on human people each time. Yeah. And they don't care. They're just adding missions for yeah. him because they don't want him to go home. And then lots of characters kind of lose it. Yeah. Uh, to varying degrees. And why wouldn't you? Because that is mentally traumatic. Uh, World War Two. So, yeah. Joseph Heller, Catch Me Too. I've got two oldies in there. 
books but from the 60s. Really goodies. Goodies. Yeah. Goodies, but oldies. Um, so continuing to work backwards, my next one is Jack of Hearts and Other Parts by Elsie Rosen, which is a YA novel um, that's about uh, a gay teenager, teenage boy who writes an advice, like a sex advice column uh, for a classmate's blog. Um, and I don't think there are any on page sex scenes, but there's a whole lot of sex advice. And it's clear that like he's a 17 year old gay boy who's had a lot of sex. Um, and believe it or not, censors hate this, <laughs> especially because it is a book for teenagers. Uh, and but, there but are also, teenagers in this book. Right. Um, and I, uh, I love it as somebody who <laughs> did not go to a school with stellar sex ed and right. did a lot of research via internet right. sex advice columns. Thank you, Scarletine, for saving my life. <laughs> um, Shout I, out to Heather Corinna. Char- Heather Corinna, you are my hero. Um, uh, also, if you need factually accurate, developmentally appropriate sex ed books, you know where we keep those, the library. Mm-hmm. Um, you can ask us. We're contractually obligated to not judge you. Um, there's a whole class on that in library school. Uh, so I just, I find Jack of Hearts and other parts, it's funny. It's, um, it talks a lot about like homophobia. The characters in it are very rich and very privileged. And so the main character spends a lot of time telling himself like, oh, I have a lot of money. I have a supportive mom. Like life could be a lot worse, mm-hmm. but but it ends up coming to terms with the fact that like, yeah, life could be a lot worse, but that doesn't mean people should be jerks to me right. because I'm gay. Right. Um, and like, I'm allowed to feel the terror of that because that's right. something that is terrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I just found it very honest Mm -hmm. um and was not at all surprised when it started showing up on on lists right um but elsie rosen who also has published uh because he publishes it for a number of different age groups as lev rosen or lev ac rosen um thumbs up on everything he's done he's a great author right on it's a good recommendation yeah i want to read that now what's your other book um my other book is Sort of like is it Summer Sisters Fahrenheit four fifty one no. and that it, like the reason it's being banned is like a really interesting head uh-huh. puzzle. Um, it's The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. Oh, because people keep trying to say it's being banned because of like sexually explicit content, but we know that's not why they're trying to ban it. So The Handmaid's Tale, my sister gave me a copy when I was in college, and I didn't look very carefully at the cover, and I thought the bonnets were like mice ears. Yeah, you are not the only person who saw that. So I said, I don't (laughs) don't want to read a book about mice. I'm like a worldly college woman now. Mm -hmm. I'm not reading Redwall anymore. Mm -hmm. What is this? What is all this? I miss you, Redwall. Um, But then like one day I was bored enough to open it, and... Lo and behold. Lo and behold. It's so good. Mm-hmm. Margaret it's Atwood. just so good. Margaret Atwood is so good. 1984, 85. Yeah. So good. So, and again, like, say what you will about, like, what the story is saying about society. It's also a damn good story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a great pick. I, uh, I love Margaret Atwood. Uh, big fan. Met her once. <gasps> Did you cry? I was at a book signing. So I would have just burst I wasn't, into tears. Yeah. She had a graphic novel out at the time that was very heavy on puns, so I was able to tell her how much I appreciate it. That's like the kind of book that we would put under a box propped up on a stick. For Jeff. If we were like, we need to catch Jeff. Yep, and it (laughs) it involves cats, too, so you would have really got it. Perfect. Perfect. A couple others I just wanted to throw out are uh, Kate Chopin's The Awakening Mm -hmm. and... Uh, also, Toni Morrison's Beloved. Can I throw mm-hmm. that into yep. the mix? Yeah, of course. Which... Oh, man, The Awakening. I read that in high school. I read like, that for in high school. school, too. Uh, we can't have young girls reading about women discovering that there might be more to life. Than washing the dishes. Than washing the dishes. Right. Uh, challenging uh, gender norms. Uh, awakenings on a few, you know, on a few levels, really. Written in 1899 or set in 1899, I can never remember, but you know, around then. Mm-hmm. And uh, Toni Morrison's beloved Civil War ghost story, but also would probably uh, set off the alarm bells because it examines the destructive legacy of slavery. I'm and- sorry, Jeff. Are we saying 
bad things have happened in American history. Apparently bad things. Here, have I have one book left on yeah. my list. Uh, and it is Red, White, and Royal Blue, which was banned in the Dearborn Public School District in November of 2022. Wait a minute. Uh, Wasn't that like a cutesy romance? It is. It, is. it had a, a cutesy cover. I'm sorry. Th- no, that's fair. It had the that's, cartoon people no, on there. Yeah, yeah. Illustri- uh, illustrated cover. It's fine. Oh, pain. It's fine. Um, I was actually recently read listening to... You, sh- you should read it. Okay. Um, so the reason it's at the top of my list uh, is... But it's romance. It's, yes. And it's a very important book to me personally because I it came out in 2019. I came out in 2019. And I read it uh, while I was in London. A lot of it takes place in London. And it has a surprise bisexual in it, which is both that it is a surprise to me, the reader, and it is a surprise to the character who is bisexual. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I read it at a time when I was like, this book was written for me specifically that, um that book was like wildly popular it oh the, it's the amazon, the amazon film is coming out in august yeah which is why i was recently listening to it on audio again and it truly is one of my favorite books yeah. um and challenged now and banned in the Dearborn public school district where wow. it was on the shelf in the high school library wow. It is not, it was not marketed as YA, but the characters are 21 and 23. Mm. Um, and a lot of kids and teenagers like to read slightly up. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I did. It's part of a sort of way of trying to figure out like what comes next and what you should be prepared for. Um, and I actually remember when that book came out, I recommended it to all of my friends and they were like, where are more books like this about people like exactly our age? Because mm-hmm. we were all like 23 at the time right, being right. like, what are we doing? Right. Um, and... And so it's just, it's a book that has a lot of personal meaning for me and has been banned very close to home because it's about two boys who fall in love with each other mm-hmm. and just like, oh no. Right. Oh dear. Right. Um, I mean, you when you sent us the, the outline of, of what we were going to cover on the pod, Jeff, you know, you asked sort of what's been brewing with the Intellectual Freedom Task Force. And one of the things that's been brewing is that sometimes when we know there's going to be maybe contentious library board meetings, we'll get asked, hey, can we come up with some talking points so that we can make sure that like supporters can can hit all the right buttons? And we got one, doesn't matter what library, you know, it was from that was like, hey, can you can you give us some support for why we should have pride displays? Because we have them and we have to now defend why we have them. And I so badly wanted to reply, people are gay. Yeah. That's that's the reason we have pride displays. Right. That's literally that is the reason we have pride displays. Well, people I- are gay, and there's Pride Month, and so we have displays for that. It's like asking why is there a you know Hispanic Heritage Display Month? Well, people are Latino. We also have a, a disability awareness month yeah. display. Dis- and there are people. Out people. There. Who, right. There are people who are disabled. People are. People. People, people are. Are. Um, index so, of history people. you know and that's not i actually that's of course not the talking point i sent because i was like i want to send you something that's going to be helpful right. but i so badly wanted to teleport myself to that meeting and be like i will be using my three minutes to just say people are gay well, over and over again why do you have a, a science fiction display people like science fiction yeah there are people yeah are. and again the question you can always ask come on in y'all that's what we is, said come on in y'all um why is that a problem right like somebody wants to ban why is that a problem right the answer. Why is that a problem? It's like a three-year-old. Right. You keep saying, why, yeah. why? But, like, let's really boil down, like, why is this a problem? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, well, so I just is... wanted to, yes. <laughs> but wait, well, unfortunately, we're out of time today, but we will be back on these mics soon. But I wanted to say, for any listeners, obviously, we're on a podcast. And that's why we're sort of gushing about these books and telling you why we like them and giving you our own subjective personal reasons. But when you go to a library and or a bookstore, even, and you see a banned book display or a challenge book display what you're typically going to see is we don't do the police tape anymore or any of that stuff but we we're just going to have the book out there and we'll probably have a few bullet points what was challenged Mm -hmm. and that is you can now reach for that book pick it up read the book knowing why it was challenged Mm -hmm. and make up your own mind you have the power you can make up your own mind um i know that that we have to hop off the mics yeah we are here in the Ferndale Library. It is the Ferndale Library podcast. Yeah. Some folks around Ferndale may be aware of some things that have happened in Ferndale. Mm-hmm. And I know we don't have a ton of time to go into it, but I just wanted to say, as one of the youth librarians yeah. who works here, um, so early in June, local folks may know that uh, some people came in and cleared out the pride displays. So why do we have pride displays, people? Are gay. Uh, they cleared out the the pride displays in the young adult section and the checked youth section. Checked them all out. They checked them all out. Yes, they, they weren't. They weren't stolen they were checked out right um 
We know, however, that this was sort of a malicious act in part because they went on the internet, internet and said and this said is a malicious act. Um, but also they replaced at least the books in children's with some of our library books about Christianity. Uh, as a Christian, I am mortally offended by this. Um, but uh, the community very, very quickly made it clear um, that these people are in the tiny, tiny, tiny minority. Very tiny minority, um, and that they love their library. And that they love the library. We weren't quite sure if those books were ever going to come back to us. They did, but we didn't know that. So we put up uh, an Amazon wish list, got filled many, many, many times over. And quickly. Uh, so, and quickly. So thanks to your generosity, we are going to be able to partner with some community partners yes. to make sure that they get copies. This makes us so happy oh, to yes. make sure that they get copies of the books because we don't need all these copies. Well, we, yeah, yes. You know, we're keeping some in case we need to replace them. I can see them from um, the window. We there's... can see there's so, so many, many of them, y'all. And people sent the kindest notes along with right. them. Um, shout out. If you are listening to this and you live on the west side of the state and you you are the, the lovely people who sent us the pride flag bunting, please <laughs> know you made everyone's absolute life. Right. Because that's staying up. That We've hung that in the back offices. Yeah. That was a treat for the staff. It was mm-hmm. incredibly, incredibly thoughtful and kind. Um, and it makes us happy yeah. whenever we look at it. Yeah. Um, we had a board meeting in June that was just, pa- I mean, people were spilling out into the hallways, packed with people coming to say kind things about the library, uh, supportive things lovely. about the workers, um, and not a single mean person showed up. Yeah. Um, and, and as a social media person, I can say it was all over everyone's Instagram stories. Yeah. I love my library so much. I love my library so much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, um, oh, yeah. So, and, and that is... Thank you. Library yes, workers thank have you. your back, and you showed that you have our backs, um, and it means the world. That and you know, hopefully every library out there feels, um, hopefully comfortable enough to, in dire times, call out to your community. Mm-hmm. You'll probably be as pleasantly surprised as we were, or perhaps not surprised. We're not surprised at all that yeah, they love us. We love where we work. That they'll come out to support you. Uh, so yes, um, library card sign up month. Get ready for it. I know it's three months away. Mark dun, dun, dun. Uh, oh, but you don't even have to wait. If you hear this, oh, you're yeah. like, gasp. Today is library card sign up day. Every day is library card sign up day in your heart <laughs> if you make it. Cricket? Yes? Closing thoughts. You, you went right up to the mic with your two blankets. What's up? Oh, that was like a posture thing more than okay, anything great. else. But um, You've been pretty cozy the whole podcast. Yeah. Thank you, Ferndale. Thank you, Ferndale. Thank you, Ferndale. And thank you at home for listening to another episode of A Little Too Quiet. It's the Ferndale Library Podcast, and it's brought to you by the friends of the Ferndale Library. We love the friends of the Ferndale Library. And uh, you too can join the Friends of the Ferndale you Library. You can join, and yeah, the Friends Friends of the Library Week is in mid October. Stay tuned for that too. We could be thanking uh, you every time we sign off, or just support this podcast by rating it, or reviewing it, or leaving a positive review, or telling uh, your friend next to you in the coffee shop, uh, "Hey, here's a cool podcast. It's got a cool name." Uh, we'll be back next week with more. Thanks for listening.